How do you take a black history course and solve the problem? Uh, er, more money for me, but I don't think so by itself. Information may or may not be taken into account. So that's one basic theme. Another, their personality tends to be abnormal, whether by nature or by nurture. Now this is basically depending on what, are you, what you're calling normal or not. And who is normal and who is not, which can go back to number three, the way you see the problem is the problem. But if you're basically saying, okay, well, black people are born with inferior brains and a limited capacity for growth, so what's the solution to that? And what's the solution to abnormal personality? These concepts of inferiority and pathology are interrelated and reinforce each other both have served to sanctify a hierarchical social order in which, quote, the Negro's place is forever ordained by his genes and accumulated disabilities of his past, i.e. his history. That is, that's why you can have um, other people teaching American history in this college say that sl slavery improved black people because black people were savages in Africa. And at least slavery exposed them to Christianity, and so they could eventually read after, you know, in the 60s. Slavery improved black people. Basically comes out of th this particular worldview. The traditional corollary to that view, say Thomas and Sillin, is that black people function best when they stay in their place that is inferior to whites. So the reason I bring this up is because this view is basically was the, the, the official view of the Confederacy, which is essentially a country set up along these two lines, where essentially uh, if I get, well, I've been called uppity, and the tradition that calls me uppity is if you think my place is below you, if I strive for equality, then I'm uppity. Right? Because my natural place is down, below you. If I strive to better myself, I'm uppity. Or if I, you think yourself equal to me, well, Superior, actually, but I'll settle for equal. <coughs> well, actually, I won't settle for equal. I'll just settle for being me, and I'll do me, and you do you. Enantiodromia. So, social tasks and privileges normal to, to white men are too stressful for the black man. Blacks living in unnatural freedom in the North were prone to insanity. Mental health was associated with contentment, with a subordinate place in society. Protest was a, dis a sign of derangement. So Dr. Samuel Cartwright, a white Southern physician, coined maladies which afflicted runaway slaves. Uh, there is a great movie, if you haven't seen it, really excellent satire called The Confederate States of America. Have I mentioned it before? Confederate States of America. Excellent satire. What, what if the South had won the war? What would America look like in the 21st century? Oh, and it's deep, because it's basically based on facts. Conditions in the South, and then just project them into the 21st century. So, Samuel Cartwright, white Southern physician, coined maladies which afflicted runaway slaves. I have one of them. This one. Drapetomania aegypticus, the flight from home madness. A mental illness that caused slaves to run away from slavery. In other words, you're crazy to want to escape slavery. So slaves afflicted with Drapetomania aegypticus always tried to escape. They had this obsession with freedom. A freedom obsession. Excessive freedom syndrome, I guess. 
and of course, diesthesia. So, Drapetomania aegypticus, diesthesia ethiopica. Now, notice within the Latin, aegypticus, oh, that's black people, and ethiopica, black people again, diesthesia, dysthesia. Also known as rascality by the uh, overseers, slaves destroyed property, avoided work, and raised disturbances with the overseers. So this was also in Oregon when they thought about, okay, we're we going to allow black people? Well, no. It's so cold and rainy here, their natural tendency to be lazy would be enhanced by the cold and raininess, so let's just keep them all out. Right? This is part of that worldview. So that's the problem, and that's how you're viewing the problem, and the solutions would be things like Jim Crow, among other things. So this is from Racism and Psychiatry, uh, Thomas and uh, Sillen, a uh, doctor and a therapist, basically looking at the question of, okay, how has our field, our discipline addressed this problem, and it doesn't really. So we have to devise our own solutions. So, in the historical view of people like Cartwright, blacks had smaller, less complex, and less evolved brains. And one of those theories that we've already seen as a result of this was the whole Blumenbach, uh, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid construct. And Sir Robert Downs of Down Syndrome, a British physician who, observing fetal alcohol syndrome, in London, whites found that part of the disformity in the face where they had epicanthic folds and they were uh, uh, dis de developmentally disabled, or the word that we used to use is mentally retarded. So when we talk about Down syndrome, uh, Down syndrome is, ca is the, the largest cause of Down syndrome is uh, exposure to alcohol in the womb from the fetus, from mom's drinking. But at the time that he lived, basically there was no concept of fetal alcohol syndrome. They considered that alcohol was no more harmful for you than water. So people just drank all through the pregnancy, creating what we know as FAS, with the predictable classic FAS face. So he's not practicing among Asians. He's observing white people with, who are producing kids because of their alcoholism with an Asian face and within that construct. Since mongoloid, this is what they're referred to as a mongoloid idiot. That's what they were producing. They didn't connect the alcoholism with that. And so, ah, well, they're racially inferior. This is proof of the racial inferiority of Asians within the Caucasoid, mongoloid, negroid construct. Okay, so these views were actually widely held and formed official policy and official scientific policy well into the 20th century until we started actually doing work to begin to change that. So, if we look at just for African Americans uh, today, and these are the, some, part of the uh, bases for coining such terms among our folk as post-slavery stress disorder, uh, multi-generational trauma. So 300 years of slavery, at least, followed by 100 years of legal and socially reinforced apartheid, that's the Afrikaans word, but we call it Jim Crow here, supported by acts of terrorism, which ended on, only ended legally about 38 years ago. So direct consequences of uh, health consequences for African Americans tied to types one, two, and three forms of racism. So overt uh, physical and verbal attacks, covert microaggressions, and uh, institutional where the institution is unaware that people are practicing for type one, type one and two within um, their walls. So there is disproportionate stress related to chronic diseases like alcohol and tobacco, tobacco addiction, overeating, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and cancer, as well as um, 
yeah, what's a new term that we'll talk about in third term with environmental racism, where who is located next to the toxic waste dump, whose houses are downwind from the oil refinery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Health consequences of structural racism. So, as an example, black people are 13% of the population and smoke one third, over one third of the cigarettes. The cigarettes marketed to African Americans are uh, menthol, which suppresses the cough reflex and are more cancerous to boot. So if we say that blacks are only 10% of the smoking deaths recorded in the year 2000, following statements and underestimates. So, more black people die every year from alcohol and tobacco, 60,000, that's in the year 2000, than the Ku Klux killed in lynchings in its history. 10,000 that were documented. So even if we were to double that, with the unknowns, that's still less than however many black people die every year from alcohol and tobacco. So cigarettes and alcohol, often drugs of choice for stress relief in America. And mental health services, including addictions treatment, are not accessed as frequently by African Americans for a variety of reasons. So, when black people are correctly diagnosed with any disease, it's usually at a later, more difficult stage to treat than whites, if it gets treated at all. And this phenomenon is called health disparity. Uh, health disparities are a form of racism, basically uh, what Fanon called type, sociostructural violence, type six. So, it produces the largest number of negative health consequences, disease and death, through the normal seemingly benign structures and policies of society. So essentially, um, when we look at the type six and we make that distinction, Jim Crow is a form of type four, where it's legal to discriminate and the institutions replicate forms of discrimination. So sociostructural violence is itself, of course, not is designed and not accidental and not random. So poverty, as Martin Luther King pointed out, is economic violence, which is also not an accident, and not due to people not being or being too lazy or whatever. So when we begin to try and attack this particular piece, uh, Judy Katz, Jewish woman from, um, published a book uh, in late. 80s, early 90s, called White Awareness, and basically she characterized um, racism as a mental illness, as a disease, a critical and pervasive form of mental illness. And she describes it by saying, racism has all the classic elements of destructive behavior, including acting out, denial of reality, projection, transference of blame, disassociation, and justification all classic symptoms of schizophrenia and psychosis. One way this disease manifests is through the delusion of white superiority, and she cites six studies dated from uh, late 60s, early 70s, that are psychological studies. Delusion of white superiority manifests itself as arrogance coupled with the disdain for anything, everything that is non-white. This is perpetuated by deliberate omission falsification and emphasis leading to a belief that everything great that was ever done was the work of whites. How many, so for example, you know, y'all can name famous African Europeans as indicated by your results on the midterm. So Europeans of African descent, all of whom were held in some high esteem but also could face, face some discrimination within their particular societies. Um, so even being a queen of England, being a general, being a famous person like Angela Solomon doesn't necessarily have them escape. So we come to the present day. I think this particular picture was, 
maybe from 08, that definitely was. So you have Mr. Wood to blame for this class. The uh, Mr. Wood was um, my social studies teacher, my American history teacher in eighth grade. And uh, April 5th, 1968, which is the day after Martin was shot, first period history class, he said he was glad that Martin was a troublemaker and had it coming. I had an A in the class at the time, and I kind of spoke out and said, uh, why is it trouble being a troublemaker to like insist that southern states obey the Voting Rights Act of 1965? Like, American citizens, democracy, Martin Luther King was fighting for that, you know, the ability to ride on a bus, the ability to vote. Why is it insisting on your American rights making trouble. That's what we were about. I got a C. And then I went, so that's first period. I go to homeroom and Mrs. Castillo, we were, we were kind of upset about <laughs> what, he, what had just gone down and Mrs. Castillo agreed with him, my homeroom teacher. So then my entire table sat down, that was during mandatory, you had to stand up to say the flag salute, we sat down. We ain't saying the flag salute. Because that liberty, and, if that's what you believe in, liberty and justice for all is a lie. And we ain't participating in that lie anymore. Right? So I haven't actually said the flag salute since then. Because, okay, well I won't say the flag salute until it's actually true, and not a promise. I won't wear a flag pin. I won't put my hand over my heart during the national anthem. I will stand. That was the compromise because the teacher had to try to kick us out and send us to the principal. And so, yeah, we'll go. Call, call my parents. Parents came in. Actually, a group of parents came in. A group of 10 parents came in. Doctors, lawyers, Indian chief. No. <laughs> Doctors, lawyers, and they said, that teacher was wrong. Those teachers were wrong. So, you reinstate our children and discipline him. And as for the flag salute, uh, we still consider it option. You know, we'll, we'll back the kids on that. So what's, what's it gonna be? So we had to stand. We didn't have to say it. Show some respect. Okay, fine, we'll do that. Compromise, right? So, so again, whoever was my president, so Obama's my president, again, I continue to work for the America I want to see that used to exist before there was an America. So, working for an America that doesn't exist yet. Okay, where national security means every human being who wishes to contribute to the common good is a citizen. Where everyone's clothed, fed, sheltered, educated to the level necessary to support themselves and their families and their mental, emotional, and spiritual health and their deepest dreams. Where they're covered. Everybody who wants to contribute is a citizen. That was the rules before 1492. That ain't the rules now as you know, okay? So, doesn't exist yet. The President's America is possibly a step towards that, so let's get the work. So, Barack is not a descendant of slaves, but he does weave in an emic cultural analysis So Martin Luther King's mountaintop speech, and you know, from, this is from the first election, the 106-year-old woman who voted for the first time or voted for him, and unite, uniting others across different differences is world worth in the ancient African concept. There is, you may have seen me wear this, I haven't rocked it lately, um, but uh, there was a USC film student, a uh, man about my age, who created this, was trying to raise money for this film project called University of the Hood. And within that, so he had all this, you know, ancient African symbolism, so you've got Two, two shields, 
each one teach one is the motto. You have winged pit bulls. Coming out of a lotus flower, you have the Ankh, love and power, University of the Hood covered with a gold braid. So, the University of the Hood, so we, you know, I have a University of the Hood uh, sweatshirt, and he basically says it's kind of like, um, you know, just like universities have their founding year, he puts it at 1619, and I said, well, you know, Black people were here before 1619. He goes, right, that's correct. But we were not under the same rules of oppression that started in 1619 in terms of the definition. So the University of the Hood is one of many names for the indigenous African empowerment matrix which arose in response to chattel slavery beginning in 1619. So we would call it, it has many names including black old school sometimes known as old school, passed on covertly from those who know to those who don't, but wish to. So part of what you've been getting in the class is that canon that hasn't been reported in books. Axiology, a few other things, 2x plus y. So its lessons are encoded in normal everyday speech, coded recursive symbology and hidden history. So that is, we repeat the symbols and they, what goes around comes around. That's another way of saying recursive. So actually that domain name doesn't exist anymore or has been taken over because rules on the internet, you can, be absor you can buy a domain name if it isn't being used or you can actually just buy a domain name but they still exist in places. So, if you would lead an evolution or revolution, study the tactics of those who came before you, successful or not. That means a asking, what is your history? Personally, and your people, that is your family, and your large, however you largely identify, what's the history of the land you are on? This is basically out of the black old school canon. What's the history of the land that you're on? What is the history of the people whose land you are on? So, for example, the rule among humanity is if you haven't been here for a hundred generations, it's not your homeland. You're a newcomer. Okay, so people who have been in a place for a hundred years, hundred generations, excuse me, hundred generations, that's two thousand years, get to name a place. The land speaks to them, and that becomes their language. Hence, England, English, France, French, German, Germany, Italy, Italian. Okay, Yankala, Kalapuya, Gamchi, Lakwan. Those people were definitely here for 2,000 years, before 1492. So, the convention, even among humans, the land is the people, and the people are the land. So whether that's phrased in Hawaiian, Hawaii is another example. People around on a piece of land, the islands, for 2,000 or more years. Then it's your homeland, because you're identified with it. Otherwise, you're a newcomer. So how did your people, how did your people before you deal with the people whose land you're on if you're a newcomer, is that question. And what did you bring to the table back then, and what do you bring to the table now? What was here to be brought to the table? Whatever the table is, and what do you bring to the table now? So all these questions, so one of the things when we start about con the concept of indigenous democracy, where every human being as well as every sentient being participates in that, but we'll start with the humans, because that's your folks, how do you create a model for everybody participating equally? How does that work? Okay, so our democracy is the Greco-Roman male dominant model where those are the only citizens. That was not the model that was here. So if you look at like Six Nations, a female egalitarian, even that, that's East Coast, you can look at that as a model 
for looking at what democracy could be like and how do we address things like the new Jim Crow. So within the University of the Hood, the empowerment matrix, if a woman or women are leaders, how are things run? Who is included and who is excluded? So we come to General Harriet Tubman. And there's a reason why she's called a general. So for example, and this is one of those hidden things where you find references in the strangest place, strangest places. So the Combahee River Statement, which was referenced in Peggy McIntosh's uh, White Male Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack paper in 1988. And she basically talked about different forms of feminism and, and referenced the Combahee Collective River State, Combahee, Combahee Collective River, Combahee River Collective Statement. So if you uh, look at that statement, which I'm not going to basically re reproduce, you can Google it and find uh, the text as well, and I think I can put it up on um, Moodle if I haven't already. It's a black lesbian feminist statement and references Harriet Tubman's leadership as a model. So it's a feminist manifesto distinguishing itself from mainstream feminism because they're basically talking about we can't be separatists, we have to basically ally with black men against racism and sexism. So as an excerpt, we are a collective of black feminists who have been meeting together since 74. During that time, we've been involved in the process of defining and clarifying our politics, while at the same time doing political work within our own group and in coalition with other progressive organizations and movements. The most general statement of our politics at the present time would be that we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, and see as our particular task the development of integrated analysis and practice based on the fact that the ma major systems of oppression are interlocking. The sy synthesis of these oppressions creates the conditions of our lives. As black women, we see black feminism as the logical political movement to combat the manifold and simultaneous oppressions that all women of color face. Mainstream feminism didn't deal with that. So Harriet Tubman, the campaign on the Combahee, June 2nd, 1863. Following dispatch, quoted in part, appeared in the front page of the Commonwealth of Boston newspaper on Friday, July 10th, 1863, Harriet Tubman. Colonel Montgomery and his gallant band of 300 black soldiers under the guidance of a black woman dashed into the enemy's country, struck a bold and effective blow, destroying millions of dollars worth of commissary stores, cotton and lordly dwellings, and striking terror in the hearts of rebellion, brought off near 800 slaves and thousands of dollars worth of property without losing a man or, or receiving a scratch. It was a glorious consummation. Now, remember that quote from Harriet Tubman, I freed a thousand slaves and would have freed a thousand more if only they knew they were slaves? Have, you used that, have I used that quote with you yet? Okay, so in the entire, what she's mostly known for is the Underground Railroad, right? conductor, right? In that, she, threw, she freed 300 slaves only. It was this operation that she freed over 100, over 800. So when she quotes, when she's quoted as saying, I have freed 1,000 slaves, like, is her math off? Because most of you only hear about the Underground Railroad piece, not that she was a military commander of an operation. Because note what the paper says. Colonel Montgomery and his gallant band of 300 black soldiers under the guidance of a black woman. So the colonel's under her. After they were all fairly well disposed of the Buford charge, in the Buford charge they were dressed in strains of thrill 